A listener's note. The following episode contains coarse language, adult themes, and content of a violent and disturbing nature, and may not be suitable for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. There's one common scene that ties most cases I cover together. At the end of a trial and sentencing, families of the victims gather in the lobby of the courthouse. It's an emotional time, and understandably so, given the excruciating toll the court process can take on these families. And the message is almost always the same. Now we can begin to heal. But for the families of Lawrence Hong, Katie Paris, Jordan Segura, Josh Hunter, and Zachariah Rathwell, the end of the court process marked the start of an agonizing journey, one that still hasn't ended. There is one woman who understands the anguish of this path like few others can. She lost her son in what was likely one of the most high-profile cases in Canadian history where the killer was found not criminally responsible. Her son was beheaded by the passenger next to him riding on a Greyhound bus. I knew a lot of what had happened to that individual on the bus before I knew it was my child. And when I heard it was my child, it just hit me like like nothing could ever hit you like that again. I it was so surreal, so unbelievable that I it was just not it was just not wanting to sink in. I'm Nancy Hickst, a crime reporter for Global News. If you're just joining me for the first time, go back to the previous two episodes of this series. In this episode, you'll hear from Timothy McLean's mother, who's fighting a seemingly endless battle to change the law in Canada, so killers deemed to be NCR would have to continue their treatment and monitoring indefinitely. I don't want to hear talk anymore. I've met all the politicians. I took this to the Senate of Canada. I presented to the House of Commons and to the Senate committee. It's not that they're not aware. I know that they're aware because I told them myself. Now it's up to everybody else to use their voice. The families of the Brentwood Five are concerned the same thing that happened to Timothy McLean's killer will happen to the man who killed their five children. This is the conclusion of the Brentwood Five Massacre. On May 25, 2016, a Queen's Bench Justice found Matthew DeGrood not criminally responsible, or NCR, for the worst mass killing in Calgary's history. According to the Canadian Department of Justice, it's considered a fundamental principle of our criminal justice system that an accused person must possess the capacity to understand that his or her behavior was wrong in order to be found guilty of an offense. In this case, the judge ruled DeGrood was suffering from a mental disorder that rendered him incapable of knowing that his actions were wrong when he fatally stabbed five young people at a house party two years earlier. I covered this case from the very beginning And I've come to learn there are a lot of misconceptions about what NCR means in Canada. It's true, the finding meant DeGroot would not go to prison, and he would not have a criminal record. He was no longer part of the Canadian criminal justice system. Instead, he was moved to the healthcare system. A lot of people assume that meant he would be sent to a psychiatric facility for the rest of his life. That's not how our system works. After being found NCR, DeGroote was sent to a secure facility for treatment, but it's far from permanent. His case is assessed on a yearly basis by the Alberta Review Board, or the ARB. The ARB 
is an independent tribunal composed of a chairperson, a psychiatrist, a member of the public, and usually a lawyer. They're mandated to review cases of people who have been deemed NCR or unfit to stand trial because of mental disorders. Each province has their own review board and each government appoints the members of the board. When de Groot's case is reviewed, the board has several options to continue his treatment in a secure facility, to grant him a conditional discharge, or to grant him an absolute discharge. In law, punishment is considered to be inappropriate in NCR cases. The board must use the least onerous and least restrictive measures necessary to address the risk, and the person's liberties under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms must be respected in each decision that's made. I'll get into what all this means for de Groot and the public in a bit. But first, I want to explain more about what these hearings mean for the families of the victims. This is really where it becomes clear that the path the families of the Brentwood Five are on is much different than in a case that's deemed a murder. Every year, these families attend another review board hearing. Imagine having to relive all the details you heard in the previous episode over and over again. It doesn't end. A few months before the review board hearing is scheduled, they send out um, a letter uh, with a form. The form asks you to you know, provide input on what uh, what you're going through. There's actually one of the questions that says, draw a picture that reflects how you feel. Um, yeah. You just so, look at it and go, yeah. really? What do you guys draw? Well, a broken I, heart maybe? Yeah, I don't know no, you don't, I, yeah, don't, I don't, I don't. I mean, I, you don't even look, I, 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 I haven't looked at the form since the first year because it's just like. Yeah. The heartbreak that Josh Hunter's parents, Barkley and Kelly experience also comes with a financial burden. And then these Alberta Review Board meetings every single year, we have to go up to Edmonton, take time off work, stay in a hotel, organize it with each other, and then to get up there and, and read a victim impact statement that's partially blacked out, that it doesn't even make sense. Patty Segura is talking about one of the most painful aspects of this process, the victim impact statements. Most people who've lost loved ones to homicide deliver just one of these heart-wrenching statements during sentencing. And then, sometimes later on, when the offender is up for parole. But the families of the Brentwood Five write and present victim impact statements every year at each annual review board hearing. And when Patty talks about her statement being partially blacked out, that's because after they're submitted, officials go through and redact anything that's deemed inappropriate. Words like murder or murderer are not allowed, as DeGrood was found not criminally responsible for the five killings. I should also note for most of the families I've met over the years, aside from losing their loved ones, writing victim impact statements is one of the hardest things they have to do. To try and put the feelings of unbearable grief and anguish onto paper is extremely personal, and it forces them to relive the trauma all over again, pouring their hearts out in front of complete strangers. For Greg Paris, Katie's father, the process makes him feel defeated. We start to think about the review board probably three or four months before. I start thinking about what am I going to write this year? And is it going to matter this year? It probably won't matter, but I have to write something. And it's because the reason I keep going is because of Katie. She's a strong-willed, 
tough person and she would never have given up on this if it was one of her brother and sisters. She would never have given up. And I will not give up either. But we spin for three or four months and then you beat the, you beat the deadline to get your, your victim impact statement in. And then for the next three or four months, you have trouble functioning again. You, you, it's hard to function. You don't trust strangers. You don't trust your friends. You don't want to hang out with people. I don't want to socialize because I'm trying to get over just retching myself in front of a bunch of strangers. And the worst part is you get doctors standing up and going, I hope it makes you guys feel better that you get to give your victim impact statement. I hope in some way that it provides some solace to you. That is a very uninformed, ignorant thing to say. It does none of those things. All it does is crush us again and bring us right back to what you and I and her are just talking about. It takes us back, right back to the day we found out she died, thinking about her autopsy report, seeing her in a casket, frozen solid, lifeless. Like every one of those images goes through your head for the next six months on either side. And then we got to start all over again next year. Katie's mother, Shannon Miller, says it's a debilitating process. Every year after the review board, I probably spend a couple months just trying to climb back out of that darkness. And it doesn't get easier because each time he's that much closer to being out. So it's that much stress. Um, and I feel like I can't think about it too, too much because I'll drive myself crazy. The way the system is set up, they never get a chance to heal. It would be nice not to have to think about it. Yeah. But every year and, you know, you, you get going up to this April 15th and when they died and then in September now we're doing the reviews and, you know, it's just a constant and it would be nice to try and heal somehow there's 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 no healing in this for for all of us it's just a, it's a continuous loop um, and the there's no healing in the review board process there's no support in the system for the families um, we've been very fortunate we've got great friends and great community around us and that's been helpful um, but not everybody in this group is doing well. Um, there, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's not an easy path. Once a year, we have to, have to. Once a year, we go and do this. Uh, we don't have to, but we have to. Um, I think the board would be much, much happier if we didn't. Um, the review board is not about the index offense. It is not about um, the people that are left. It is about uh, the patient. It is about his well-being, his progress, uh, his support. What Zachariah Rathwell's mother, Rhonda Lee, is saying is, they're allowed to present victim impact statements, to speak about their loved ones and how the loss has changed their lives. But bottom line, the board looks at evidence from the doctors, not the victim impact statements in making its decision. To date, including the trial, the families have presented victim impact statements five times. There have been four review hearings with a fifth coming up in September of 2020. The very first hearing to review DeGrude's status was held in July of 2016, less than two months after the trial. For Lawrence Hong's father, Lorenzo, it was almost too much to take. We just could not get out of that grief. It's and a difficult situation that I never encountered. And I, I hope that nobody no other parents should ever go through what we went through. It should never have happened. No parents deserve that. Nobody deserves this. 
but here we are. We are suffering. Jordan Segura's mother, Patty, says as they try to cope with the devastating loss, they also have a steep learning curve, navigating a path they never thought they'd be on. It's a something I've had to experience as time goes. Nobody has sat us down and said, this is how you do this. We figured things out as we go along. The families try to express how this massacre has impacted their lives. So broken. It's a, it's a difficult situation, right? Uh, we were a happy family and now we're brokenhearted. And the, sad, the saddest part thing is, there's no end to having a broken heart. Nothing could fill that void. Lorenzo and Marlene Hong think of Lawrence every time they enjoy a good meal. Cooking. Cooking. He has uh, a very uh, good taste bud. Yeah, especially. And he would remember. Uh, sauces from other restaurants that you, you would, whenever there's a new place or a recommended uh, uh, restaurant, he would be there and he will have a memory of all those sauces and flavors. He will come back home and look at our pantry. And so, start, and start okay. testing it. <laughs> yes. And he, he will be asking, Marlene said, well, are we missing anything else? He will do some, uh, some reading and research into it. Okay, we need to buy this uh, certain spices. And we try a lot. And that's one way of our family time. For Shannon Miller, an overwhelming sense of grief can be brought on any time any day in an instant. That was Katie's go-to food. She really loved popcorn. So when I smell popcorn, that reminds me of her. I didn't eat probably for three years and I didn't go to the theater either because I could smell it. Uh, just things that would really trigger. Um, driving has changed for me. The, I probably shouldn't have been driving for a few years afterwards even. But even now, if I see a white car with a young girl with a messy bun in her hair, you know, it, it's that one split second of, oh, that's Katie, oh, it's not. Or I'll see something on TV or see something shopping. And again, it's that one millisecond, right? Where it's like, oh, I should let Katie know. But then you have to deal with the, the truth and the reality that you know, no, no, she's not here to let her know. So that's what I mean by like every aspect of my life and my family's life. Patty Segura thinks of Jordan every day, but it's on special occasions that it hits her the hardest. People think that the first year is the hardest year and that's not accurate with me. The first year was a very difficult year but the Christmases after don't get any better. Jordan's birthday, I do everything I can to honor Jordan. And it just makes me angry. And then by the time his birthday's over, I'm sad and I'm crying because he's not here. I cook his favorite meal and we, Julie and Antonella come over and we have what Jordan would have wanted. But it does not get easier. For the hunters, it's some of the simplest of times with Josh that they miss the most. I have a hard time talking about it without. <laughs> Sorry. That's the things that I miss the most is just our home time and in the mornings I'd get up and go down and he was good buddies with her with our dog and I'd take the dog out of the mudroom and go into his room and the dog would hop up on the bed and he'd stretch right out along Josh and we'd sit there and have a conversation 
you know, just what he was up to, what his day was going to be like, and he'd sit there and scratch the dog and just have a chat and start the day and then be off and I miss those times a lot. <laughs> Rhonda Lee Rathwell struggles daily with overwhelming grief. You know, I'd make a grocery list and he'd add what he needed. Um, I put on a coat, a raincoat, and in it was an old uh, grocery list that had my writing and then had his, the things that he wanted. So, um, yeah, it was hard to go back to work, um, but I needed to for more for social stuff, like I was just sitting in my house being sad. Every time you start to grieve, and, and I lost my dad um, four years before Zach was killed, um, and so I, I know that grieving process, and, I, and I, I understand it, I've been through it. I had the ups and the downs and the backs and the forths and the, you know, the, the pleading and all of that stuff. When I start to do that with Zach, my brain just shuts down because the pain of how he was killed and the thoughts of him in those last minutes, the absolute terror and shock that he must have been in when this person turned on him and started stabbing him. I just, I go there and that stops the grieving process because now I'm, now I'm having this, this traumatic thoughts. And, and so, yeah, the, you know, the, the grief is, is just stopped in its tracks and you have to grieve. You have to, in order to, to move on. And I'm just in this loop where I, where I can't. From the moment DeGrood was found NCR, the five families expressed concerns about his future. Would he one day be back out in the community? What would stop this from happening again? Once diagnosed with schizophrenia, DeGrood began taking medication. Doctors report his status every year to the review board and the board decides if there's still a significant threat to the safety of the public. To determine that risk, the board looks at the likelihood of DeGrood becoming psychotic once again, and what he would likely do if he did become psychotic. Given the level of violence he used during his last psychotic episode, that's a major factor for the board to consider. I should note, it's not up to DeGrood to prove he isn't a risk. Rather, it's up to the board to find evidence that he is a risk. If they don't find any evidence of risk to the public, the board is compelled under current legislation to provide a conditional or an absolute discharge. Early on, the five families wanted assurances from the board that DeGrood would be kept in a secure facility indefinitely. But the families don't get a say in deciding what freedoms DeGrood is given. The board is mandated to focus solely on risk and public safety. So, as I mentioned earlier, there's little consideration given to victim impact statements. To me, us being able to go and participate in the uh, in the process and read victim impact statements is an appeasement. It's not really designed to provide input into what decisions are made. Um, and throughout this, having been through it a few times now, I've confirmed that I've actually been able to speak with somebody, and they say, "Yeah, you're you're right. We're guided by." criminal code of Canada that says least onerous, least restrictive way possible. And if he's doing well on his meds and is controlled, they're going to walk him down that path. And there's not really anything that we say or do that's going to change that because it's the the law. 
probably after the second victim impact, uh, after the second review, I started to have doubts. And then last year was an absolute disaster on every account because they not only didn't follow the recommendations of the treatment team, they went way beyond and they were extremely disrespectful and insensitive to us. Like we were some, in some way the perpetrators of all their problems. And I'm talking about the review board here. And I was like, oh man, we are in a lot of trouble. Yeah, they almost kicked us out of the room. In the ARB decision Greg Paris is referring to, the board was critical of the families of the victims and stated some of the victim impact statements contained inappropriate content and went on to detail at length things that were not allowed, including advocating for a specific decision. Following that, Greg sent a letter to the chair of the ARB to express his concern at how the victims are treated by the board. He asked for an investigation into the conduct of the ARB in the DeGroote case. The two people that I pointed out in my complaint weren't on the board this year, even though they're still part of the review board. So I take some solace that someone within the Justice Department did something about it and said, well, we gotta change some people up now. The prosecutors involved would say, well, it's scheduling and everything else. I find it interesting that the two people that I had my biggest problem with in terms of their insensitivity and disrespect were not on the board this year. And we got treated with much more respect again, like we had been the first two years. But last year was disgusting. The one chair lady who ran it this year, she was very, very nice. She was very heartfelt. She was explained everything. She actually talked to us. Whereas last year that the the guy that was the judge, he was, that was horrible. The law in Canada is clear. The board has to impose the least onerous restrictions on DeGroote while protecting the safety of the public. Just 10 months after he was declared not criminally responsible, de Groot began asking for increased freedoms. And by early 2017, he was granted ground privileges, which meant he was allowed to go outside of the secure facility under supervision. The following year, in 2018, two years after being declared NCR, de Groot was moved to a secure facility in Edmonton a three hours drive north of Calgary. Doctors described DeGrude as a model patient, and at that time, he was granted unsupervised ground privileges, as well as passes into the city as long as he was supervised by a responsible adult. Both of his parents have been granted that status. He was also allowed to leave for 24 hours at a time to stay with his family. By 2019, the freedoms were increased again, this time exponentially. While he still lives in the secure facility in Edmonton, he's allowed unsupervised visits into the city. Other freedoms granted by the board include overnight passes that extend to a week for the purpose of transitioning into a group home. He can also travel anywhere in the province for up to a week with a responsible adult. The doctors who treat and assess DeGrood testify at each of the hearings. They've made it clear schizophrenia cannot be cured. It can be managed. According to the most recent decision, if DeGrood stops taking his oral and injectable medication, he's likely to relapse within weeks or months, and the relapse is likely to become full-blown. Last year, there was evidence of mental deterioration during a change in his medication. His symptoms were insomnia and increased activity. His doctor also stated that deterioration helped him develop a more accurate picture of a relapse signature, So officials would know what's likely to happen 
prior to a psychotic episode, basically a guide for what to watch for. At that time, doctors said there was under-recognition and under-reporting by DeGroote of his developing symptoms. In other words, there may have been a deterioration of his otherwise good insight. What this means is, doctors feel when DeGroote's medication is working, he has a good understanding of his mental health and the need for treatment. When his medication is not working, his perception deteriorates along with his condition. Doctors also testified that the violence could once again be catastrophic if he does re-enter a psychotic state. All of these things raise more questions for the five families. How can anyone be sure he'll take his medication and if those meds are even working? unless he's in a secure facility or continually monitored in the community. The ultimate goal of the entire NCR process is to rehabilitate, reintegrate, and let them go on their way. Absolute discharge with no checking in. They're not better, they're medicated. They're never going to be better. He's schizophrenic, there's no cure. He's medicated, he's not better. From what I understand, stress is his biggest trigger. So how much stress is it? How much of that is going to take him so that his meds aren't maybe enough meds because he's been triggered with this stress or that sort of thing? And who wants to, t I just don't understand who wants to take that risk. We know our kids paid with their lives, you know, from for what he, what he did and and his illness so i just don't understand why they're willing to take the risk i shudder at the thought that if he's stressed and it will trigger and like the treatment team said he's not likely to have a relapse but once it has a relapse He's been triggered. The potential for this, uh, uh, for a violent in, uh, incident, is very severe. So, you're telling me that the drugs that he's taking are fine, and and he probably won't reoffend. But if he does, it will be catastrophic. He will kill people. He'll kill everyone in the room. And. I just don't understand how anyone is willing to take that chance. I don't know what else to say to people to convince them that it's their problem too, not just the problem of the five families, and this needs to change. Matthew DeGruy cannot be giving an absolute discharge. Change to the criminal code that um, would prevent somebody that's committed violent crime or murder uh, from ever being absolutely discharged. So at a minimum. At that, that, that's, that's the starting point. So if, 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 if that could happen, that would be great. The families of the five young people killed by Matthew DeGroote are calling for an immediate review of the decision to grant him more freedom. DeGroote was found not criminally responsible, and tonight there are renewed calls for greater accountability in these types of cases. Global's Nancy Hicks is working on this story and joins us now with more. Nancy. There are three options for people deemed not criminally responsible. They can be sent to a secure facility for treatment. They can be granted a conditional discharge or an absolute discharge. Most people look to the case of Vince Lee as the bar for what can happen in Canada. Lee, now known as Will Baker, was found not criminally responsible for beheading 22-year-old Timothy McLean on a Greyhound bus in Manitoba in 2008. He was granted an absolute discharge, complete freedom, less than a decade after McLean was killed. Calgary's worst ever mass killer, Matthew DeGroote, is still in a secure facility, but he is receiving increased freedoms in an attempt to reintegrate him into society. Once they start fast track, it, it doesn't slow down. Um, my, my heart 
and my sympathies and my support are going to be with the family and the friends of Zach, Jordan, Caitlin, Josh, and Lawrence. I've been in touch with um, several members of those families, and it's heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking that 10 years later, nothing's changed. The issue for the families of these victims is accountability. In Vince Lee's case, he's promised to take his medication, but there isn't anyone who checks to make sure he does. The one person who can relate to the anxiety the families of the Brentwood Five are experiencing is Carol Didelli, Timothy McLean's mother. He was a free spirit. He was wild. He um, <laughs> rather undisciplined, uh, but so fun. Like he, he's just left such a void. He was so bright and energetic and electric. Timothy was an adventurer at heart. He quit high school, and soon after, he began to travel, taking in every bit of nature he could. His goal was to end up living in BC. Timothy was very much a minimalist. He liked to sofa surf. He traveled lightly. Pretty much everything he possessed was in a backpack. What Timothy lacked in physical stature, he made up for with a big personality which made him an ideal candidate for carnival work. He had been working with the carnival, I think this was his third summer, going um, across the provinces. No matter where he would go, he made time for his mom. And those chats always included a special request. He would call me from just about everywhere that he was staying to ask for a chocolate chewy double chocolate cookie recipe. And he would make them wherever he was living. I didn't have a cell phone, or if I did, I, I had just gotten one. Now, I mean, I would take a picture of it and send it, but back then, no, I'd have to give it to him over the phone each and every time. But yeah, his friends still call and ask for that recipe. In fact, one did three days ago. In June of 2008, Timothy made sure he was back in Manitoba for his younger brother's graduation. After that, he headed back to work on the carnival circuit. And the last time I saw my son, he was crossing the street from the hotel when we left. One minute. It was a warm summer evening, beautiful night. When we were leaving, he was going the opposite way from ourselves to go to our vehicles. And he was in the middle of the street, no cars coming, and he turned around and he said, Bye, Mom. I love you. I'm going to be famous one day. And he turned around and went to his car. I had no idea the last day on the world, on this earth, would make him famous. But it has. By the end of July that same year, Timothy rode a Greyhound bus across the prairies with the goal of ending up back home in Winnipeg. His mom was working as a meal coordinator for a senior's residence at the time. And on July 30th, 2008, she had the news on as she prepped that night's dinner. I remember us all being so... Oh my God, that's so horrible. It, it, when I initially heard it, my first response was, what state did that happen in? And then my next response was, oh my God, that happened here. That happened close to here. Then I realized it was less than an hour from where we are. We all said a prayer for the family and the murdered person. What she saw on the news shocked the entire nation. A man riding on a Greyhound bus west of Winnipeg had repeatedly stabbed and mutilated another passenger. The victim was beheaded. I remember saying to the senior ladies, well, that my son would have been on that bus, but he came home two days earlier or whatever, and uh, turned out I was wrong. It never crossed Carol's mind that the victim could be her son. It was 24 hours after the killing before we were, um, before Timothy was 
positively identified and we were informed. The reason they said it took so long, they didn't want to make any mistakes with his identity and he was a difficult, it was difficult to make that identification because of the uh, mass destruction of his body. I knew a lot of what had happened to that individual on the bus before I knew it was my child. And when I heard it was my child, it just hit me like, like nothing could ever hit you like that again. I, it was so surreal, so unbelievable that I, it was just not, it was just not wanting to sink in. I felt like I was standing on a precipice of craziness that I, I could have lost my mind right there because I remember it being so horrific that I wanted to laugh. I hit, I hit the ground, I landed on my knees and I screamed. I ran out the front door and I screamed, no. But I know that at that moment, I felt like I was right on the edge. And I had to yank myself back because it could have gone. It could have gone the other way. The bus was pulled over and passengers were stretching their legs. Carol's son, Timothy McLean, smiled at a stranger and asked how he was doing. The stranger's name was Vince Lee. When everyone got back on the bus, he sat at the front. Timothy returned to his seat at the back of the bus, put his earbuds in, closed his eyes, and rested his head against the window. Later, the stranger, Vince Lee, took a seat next to Timothy. Shortly after that, and without warning, Lee violently attacked him. Witnesses reported hearing Timothy scream. He jumped up and tried to defend himself, but Lee easily overpowered him and he had nowhere to go. The first two stab wounds were fatal, but the attack continued. There were over a hundred stab wounds to his body. The first two were fatal, neck and upper chest. He didn't suffer for a long time, which was good. But the mutilation that occurred following his initial death is what I struggle with. While the violence against Timothy went on, the driver and other passengers escaped. RCMP and special negotiators were outside of the bus for nearly five hours. During that time, Vince Lee kept stabbing and mutilating Timothy. I need to warn you, these details are graphic. Lee removed Timothy's internal organs and then cannibalized him. He took Timothy's severed head and held it in his hand, taunting onlookers. I will never get my head around RCMP standing for four hours and 48 minutes and not stopping what was happening to my son. Lee opened a window on the bus and jumped out, and he was finally arrested. Timothy's ear, nose, and tongue were found in Lee's pocket. He was later charged with second-degree murder. But less than a year after the violent attack, Lee was found not criminally responsible for his actions. Court heard that he had a history of mental illness that was documented since at least 2004. The court decision in this case states that Lee was involuntarily committed to a mental hospital in 2005 and was diagnosed as suffering from schizophrenia, although he was resistant to treatment and did receive some medication before, it appears, he left the treatment facility without permission. The judge noted that back in 2005, Lee's symptoms were virtually identical to those exhibited when he killed Timothy McLean. 
Lee suffered from auditory hallucinations and believed he heard the voice of God telling him to kill Timothy. After being declared NCR, he was sent to a mental health facility in Manitoba, and in the years that followed, his freedoms were gradually increased. In 2016, less than eight years after he killed Timothy McLean, Vince Lee changed his name to Will Baker. That same year, the review board allowed him to live on his own in a Winnipeg apartment, while subject to conditions and nightly monitoring to make sure he took his medication. It was only a few months later, in February 2017, less than nine years after the brutal greyhound slaying, Vince Lee, a.k.a. Will Baker, was granted an absolute discharge. That ruling gave him complete freedom. Vince Lee walked away from a treatment facility. He'd been seen in, I think, three provinces. How many opportunities for help that gets turned down, diagnoses that get ignored, medications that aren't taken, is it going to take? How many more innocent people are going to die at the hands of a not criminally responsible killer who then is freed with no criminal record to do it again. According to a 1999 ruling by the Supreme Court of Canada, R versus Winko, a review board must order an absolute discharge if a person doesn't pose a significant threat to public safety. And in Lee, or Baker's case, the board ruled he no longer posed a threat. Timothy's mother has since fought to change legislation. She believes absolute discharges should be taken off the table for killers deemed to be not criminally responsible. But so far, that change hasn't happened. I don't want to hear talk anymore. I've met all the politicians. I took this to the Senate of Canada. I presented to the House of Commons and to the Senate committee. It's not that they're not aware. I know that they're aware because I told them myself. Now it's up to everybody else to use their voice. In light of what happened in that case, the families of the Brentwood Five worry DeGrood will also be granted an absolute discharge. Absolute discharge uh, would be the ultimate. He doesn't have to report to anybody. Nobody, nobody's going to be monitoring him. He could do whatever he wants. He is on a path, an accelerated path to absolute discharge, where people need to understand he is no longer supervised by anyone. He does not have to go to a psychiatrist and check in. He does not have to have his drugs of you know, tested to see how much drugs he has in his system, to see he's taking his drugs. He's completely free to go. As I mentioned earlier in this episode, Matthew DeGrood has been described as a model patient, and that's why his freedoms have been increased at each review board hearing. And his defense lawyer, Alan Fay maintains he'll always take his medication, whether he's in a facility or in the community. Let's be clear. My client has been completely medication compliant from the get-go. He wants to take his medication. He wants to remain well. He does not want to ever go back to where he was. And I think problem here is some people seem to think that that deep down he's just a, a psychotic killer and he's welcoming the opportunity to revert to that status and 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 that's just that's ridiculous I think you know the families have expressed concern that if he would be someone who wants to be compliant and always take his medication then why not consent to a conditional discharge where you would be mandated, you would have to check in, 
and there would be checks and balances to make sure you would take your medication. Why not consent to that? Well, first and foremost, it's not a question of him consenting. It's what the Alberta Review Board directs. But could he not proactively say, I'm not asking for an absolute discharge. Take it off the table. Let me sign this paper and say that that's what I would do. I guess that's what the families are wondering. But by law, he's entitled to an absolute discharge. All he wants, all I want for him, are what he is legally entitled to. The same way as the families of the victims want what they are legally entitled to. The law of Canada sets out the procedure. It sets out what should happen. As stated in the Alberta Review Board's most recent decision on DeGroote's case, there is a concern that if he would go off his medication, his insight would decrease. And I quote, create a real risk that he could continue to deteriorate to a point where medications are avoided, end of quote. The bottom line is this, at this point, as a result of his medication, Matthew DeGroote is rational. He is well. He recognizes that if he does not take his medication, he will become unwell again. And in an unwell state, he could hurt someone. That is the last thing that Matthew DeGroote wants. That is the last place that Matthew DeGroote wants to go. Matthew DeGroote is dedicated to doing everything in his power to remaining well. And if that means re taking medication for the rest of his life, he has made it clear he's prepared to do that. And he doesn't need a conditional discharge to ensure he does that. I mean, I, I mean, again, there seems to be this illusion that he's just looking for the opportunity to go off his medication. He's not. As it stands now, under current Canadian law, if the board deems Matthew DeGroote no longer poses a risk to the public, he must be granted a conditional or an absolute discharge. So, if this person is doing really well and following their treatment, then how would I find that this person poses a significant risk at this point in time? And so, again, in Winko, the court says you can't just speculate about down the road, at some point in the future, if he was to stop taking his medication. That's not a sufficient basis for restricting his liberty at this time. Forensic psychologist Dr. Patrick Bailey has nearly 30 years' experience. He's also a lawyer and was admitted to the bar about a decade ago. He's done approximately 3,500 psychiatric assessments in criminal cases. Dr. Bailey has also testified before parliamentary justice committees to look at amendments to the criminal code and is part of a national research team studying NCR cases for the purpose of giving our government a better picture of national statistics and trends. That research helps politicians to understand how NCR is used in each province and flag any issues with underuse or overuse. Nationally, there are approximately 400 NCR cases every year. Less than 10% of those involve serious personal violence or homicide. Bailey told me most of those cases eventually result in absolute discharges. The problem is, if review boards grant an absolute discharge to someone found to be NCR for a serious violent offense, and then that person goes off their medication, the risk to the public can be extreme. Bailey pointed out two known high-profile cases where offenders were declared NCR in violent cases, went on to be discharged, and then violently reoffended. We certainly know countless cases of individuals who stop taking their medication because they believe that they're now well, um, or they don't like the side effects of the medication, uh, and so they opt to stop taking it because some of those side effects can accumulate over time. Or we know, unfortunately, that some of the medications stop being effective. And so unless you have that ongoing monitoring, even if this person is willing to take their medication, it might not be working for them anymore. So 
why not continue to have some measure of monitoring for these relatively rare personal injury cases? The issue, once again, comes back to Canadian legislation. And Dr. Bailey believes one change could alleviate a lot of concerns. So my suggestion has been that the notion of an absolute discharge could be taken off the table for those relatively rare serious personal injury offenses. Again, this wouldn't impact a lot of people deemed to be NCR, as only a fraction of NCR cases involve serious personal injury or death. And again, we're not talking about the 90% of NCRs where the individual has uh, left a restaurant without paying or has um, engaged in what we call causing, causing a disturbance, so yelling and screaming in a public setting where there isn't any particular danger to the public, those individuals would still be entitled to their absolute discharges when the board has determined that public safety can be addressed. We're talking about a relatively small number where there's a serious personal injury element to the offense, where we would say, in those circumstances, we want to have a longer term of supervision and monitoring and participation in treatment. So let me be clear, there are some people in the mental health community who don't appreciate me having advanced the idea because they see it as restricting the liberty of somebody who's otherwise earned an absolute discharge. Um, I understand that. I also understand the what I consider to be very reasonable public concern about individuals who've committed serious violent offenses being in a position where they obtain an absolute discharge and they're no longer any, under any supervision. I don't think that the supervision is onerous to say you will continue to see your psychiatrist, you'll continue to take medications as directed, and once a year you're, gonna, you're going to come back before the review board for us to decide how you're doing. And so the review board gets regular updates on this person's participation in treatment. If they miss an opportunity to attend an appointment or they're not taking their medication and there are ways of monitoring that, then the review board still has some authority to say, we need you to come back into hospital until we figure out what's going on. Once you've granted that absolute discharge, there is no one that has any authority over this individual unless they fall under the provisions of the Mental Health Act, which requires a significant degree of deterioration before the person gets to that point. I don't think that requiring a person to follow up with what they've already offered to do and what they show, when they show insight into their own mental illness, uh, when they're highly motivated to want to follow through on treatment, and the only condition that you're putting on them is that they have to follow through on treatment, I don't see where that's onerous. It might all sound like a simple enough fix, but so far the Canadian government has not taken action. If there's a, a Calgary MP who wants to bring it forward as a private member's bill, then we would find out where the government and the opposition stand on making that kind of a change. Um, so it doesn't have to be the government that makes the change in legislation, it can be an opposition MP. Timothy McLean's mom wanted the government to act before the man who killed her son was released without any conditions. That didn't happen. Now, the families of the Brentwood Five want federal politicians to take action before DeGroote is granted an absolute discharge. Because that is the path he's currently on. So he could be your neighbor, he could change his name like Vince Lee did. And so that should be scary to, to everybody out there that he he's on a path to be completely unsupervised. So this is why we're speaking now because they're starting, they're starting exactly what Vince Lee did at year six, in year three for DeGroote. In year six, he got to go to a halfway house to live. Year seven, after this is, these are years after he's found NCR. I'm only talking about that. Year seven, he was absolutely discharged, Vince Lee, and he was on his way. DeGroote's there at year three. By the end of this year, he's gonna be living in a, in a supervised halfway house. But you see the progression. That's what everyone should be afraid of. To us as a parents, we just have to hang on to our memories. Our, our Lawrence is not coming back. Right? We just really wishes that nothing will happen to other people. 
Nobody deserves to go through the grief that we were going through. Clearly, he's ill and violent when he's not on his medication. I don't know, for me personally, it's just what, what are you willing to risk as a society? And, you know, that means laws need to be changed. This could happen to anybody's children, anybody's. It could be, happen to anybody's loved ones. It could happen at Walmart when they're shopping or at Tim Hortons in the lineup. As long as they give Matthew DeGruy freedom, everybody is at risk, wherever they go. Doesn't matter who they are or where they are. Now, they trust him that if he was having delusions, he would tell them, right? They really, really believe that um, he wouldn't lie to them because he doesn't want to do it again. And I hope and pray that's true, but I'm not willing to risk more people being killed. Why take the risk? Why would you take the risk of all of society for this one person? The families of the Brentwood Five are creating a special place where they'll be able to honor their kids and find solace. It's called the Quintera Legacy Garden. This project acknowledges the incredible support the families have received from the community. It will be a peaceful and vibrant outdoor space where visitors can reflect, heal, and remember. And it will be the first fully dedicated music garden and performance space in Calgary. The families want to reflect the qualities the Brentwood Five embodied, including hope, possibility, and creativity. There are five branches, five leaves, and five roots in the garden logo, along with a five-pointed star on the stage and five chairs placed in front of the five flowering trees planted in the garden. It's a place where the spirits of Lawrence, Katie, Jordan, Josh, and Zach can live on. And everyone can see that beyond tragedy and loss, there is light. Thank you so much for listening. If this is the first time you've listened to Crime Beat, please go back and take the time to check out the other stories I've shared. These are all such important cases. And please consider sharing Crime Beat with your friends. I would love to have you give our show a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Crime Beat is written and produced by me, Nancy Hickst, with producer Dila Velasquez. Audio editing and sound design is by Rob Johnston. Special thanks to photographer-editor Danny Lantella for his work on this episode. And thanks to Chris Bassett, the National Director of Content and Editorial Standards for Global News. If you have a question about one of the episodes, send them my way. You can send me a message on Twitter at Nancy Hickst, on Facebook at Nancy Hickst Crime Beat, and I'd love to have you join me for added content on Instagram at nancy.hickst. That's N-A-N-C-Y dot H-I-X-T. Thanks so much for listening. Please join me next time.